Welcome to Lesson 2D, Introduction to Kinematics. We're going to begin a discussion about kinematics and fluid flow. I'll discuss differences between Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions. We'll define the material derivative, and then we'll apply it to Newton's second law. First, a definition. Kine is the Greek root for motion or movement. So kinematics is the study of motion. In kinematics, we describe fluid motion without trying to understand the physics. The physics will come later. In fluid mechanics, we have two kinds of descriptions, Lagrangian and Eulerian. The Lagrangian description is what you're probably most used to. It's where you follow individual fluid particles as they interact. This is similar to high school physics, where you looked at a billiard ball and what happens when it strikes another billiard ball. Now imagine dozens of these billiard balls we follow each individual ball. This is good when you have a few number of balls, but in fluid flow, you can imagine we have billions of fluid particles. Where this term is taken loosely, we imagine a very small particle or parcel of fluid that's moving with some velocity, and there are millions or billions of these particles that are also moving around it. It's virtually impossible to keep track of billions of particles. With supercomputers, you can do this kind of analysis, but even then it's limited. That leads us to the Eulerian description, which is usually preferred in fluid mechanics. Instead of following these fluid particles, we have some volume, and we look at a point in that volume, and you watch the fluid that passes by. Instead of keeping track of the speed or the velocity of each of these particles, we care only about the particle that happens to be at this point at a given time. We define its velocity vector as u, a function of space, coordinate, x vector, and time. But we're going to use tensor notation, so we write this as ui, with free index i, as ui of xi and t. But to avoid confusion, since we have two i's in this right-hand side, we write i not summed. Duck has two i's, but he's always confused. <laughs> Don't you ever stop. You two shouldn't argue so much. You're brothers. You tell them, Ned. In the Eulerian description, we don't care about individual particles, just the flow field, where this is the flow field variable for velocity. And this is our field, or you can think of it as a control volume. Now let's talk about the material derivative, also called the substantial derivative, total derivative, or particle derivative. The problem is that the Eulerian description is more convenient to describe fluid flows, but laws of motion, example, conservation of mass, linear momentum equation, conservation of energy, etc., are written fundamentally in the Lagrangian description. For example, Newton's second law, the well-known equation F equal ma, applies directly to a billiard ball. This is the equation we would use to analyze billiard balls hitting each other. With this as our problem, our goal is to write Lagrangian laws, like Newton's second law, in Eulerian form, since Eulerian is more convenient, as we've said. How do we achieve this goal? The answer is that we use the material derivative. First, let's define it. Let Q be any quantity or property. It can be a scalar, a vector, or even a tensor of any order. We want to express q as a field variable, q equal q of xi and t, as we wrote for velocity previously. This is the Eulerian description. But as we said, q is fundamentally expressed following a fluid particle, which is the Lagrangian description. We'll write it with a subscript p, where p means particle. So qp is qp of xpi and t where xpi is the position vector of the particle. xpi is a function of time. In other words, suppose that you have a record of where a certain particle is as a function of time. We express that as coordinate vector xp. Now consider the time rate of change of qp following a fluid particle. We write d of qp dt equal dqp, which is a function of xpi of t and t dt. We use the chain rule. Since qp is a function of more than one variable, it's partial derivative del qp del t plus del qp del xpi dxpi dt. 
Note that since xpi is a function only of time, we use a total derivative here, but we use partials here, since qp is a function of more than one variable. Let's call this equation 1. As a quick review of tensor notation, we can expand this, where qp is a function of the three components of vector xp and time, so the derivative dqp dt is del qp del t plus del qp del xp1 dxp1 dt. We repeat for the other two components, indices 2 and 3, and perhaps we see more clearly how the chain rule is working. But this expression is identical to this expression in tensor notation, where the chain rule kind of falls out automatically, since this repeated index implies we're summing over 1, 2, and 3. But following a fluid particle, dxp1 dt is equal to u1, dxp2 dt is equal to u2, and similarly for u3, by definition. We can collect all these together and write dxpi dt equal ui. I'll call that equation 2. We plug equation 2 into equation 1. We get dqp dt equal del qp del t plus ui del qp del xi. This will be our equation 3. Now here's the tricky part. This is our fluid particle at some point in the flow, and this is a streamline, and this fluid particle has some property q. We define some origin at this location, and at this instant in time, xi is the position vector of our fluid particle. Now we consider the fluid particle that happens to occupy the point in space, that is this red point here, under consideration. So we argue that at this point in time, xi is the same as xpi. This vector is the same, since we're talking about this particle at this time, and qp equal q. Thus equation 3 becomes dq dt following a fluid particle equal del q del t plus ui del q del xi. And I just realized that I forgot my subscript p in equation 3 here, which was correct in equation 1. We give this derivative special notation, namely capital DQ DT, where the words following a fluid particle are implied by this capital D. So this is our final equation for what we call the material derivative of Q. The material derivative is thus the derivative of Q with respect to time following a fluid particle, and it's the total rate of change of Q following a fluid particle. We see that it has two parts, what we call the local part, due to unsteadiness in the flow. This part would be zero for a steady flow field. This part is called the advective part. Advective is just another name for movement, so this is due to movement of the fluid particle to a different location in the flow. I should mention that some people call this the convective part, but I prefer advective since convective, to me, represents heat transfer. In vector notation, if q is a scalar, dq dt is del q del t plus u dot del q. But as I said, in tensor notation, this q can be anything, scalar, vector, or tensor. Let's apply this material derivative to Newton's second law. Here's the material derivative we just derived, and here's Newton's second law. The reason I changed dummy index i to k is because I use index i as my vector description in Newton's second law. Fundamentally, Newton's law applies to a fluid particle, where force Fp applied to the particle causes an acceleration Ap. Again, P means particle. By the way, this is the Lagrangian description that we're used to from high school physics. Before I do more substitution, in fluid mechanics, since the fluid particle shrinks to a point in the flow, we like to use force per unit volume instead of force itself. Otherwise, this mass would go to zero. So let's define little f pi equal f pi over volume, and rho p, the density, is mp over volume. Or in field variables, the Eulerian description, lowercase fi is uppercase fi over volume, and rho is m over volume. And as we pointed out, when we do this transformation between Eulerian and Lagrangian, f pi and fi are the same since we're talking about this point and whatever fluid particle happens to be there at that instant in time. It has the same force and the same acceleration, 
So the Lagrangian form of Newton's second law on a per volume basis is FPI equal rho P API. But since these two are the same as we just discussed, we can write this as FI equal rho API, which is rho dui dt, where we let our variable Q be ui. Following a fluid particle then, the acceleration of the fluid particle is du pi dt equal dui dt. We get that directly by letting Q equal ui in the material derivative. So we can write AI equal del ui del t plus uk del ui del xk. You can now see why I changed this dummy index from i to k. This is thus the material acceleration, which is the acceleration following a fluid particle. So this is our expression of Newton's second law in terms of material acceleration. For some reason, fluid mechanics people like to write Newton's law backwards, where rho dui dt equal fi. Combining these, we write rho del ui del t plus uk del ui del xk equal fi. This is now in the Eulerian description. We need some physics to figure out what this fi is, the right-hand side. But my final comment here is that the left-hand side of this equation, which I'll call equation 4, is the left-hand side of the famous Navier-Stokes equation. And we see from this analysis that the Navier-Stokes equation comes directly from Newton's second law. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.